Deixa eu tentar. Hello, I'm Ignat Solovey, the cameraman and presenter of Flight TV, the only program about Russian general aviation. In this 19th English issue, the restoration of a legendary helicopter and warm reception of Russian amphibian airplane in Europe. But first, to the news. Master and doctorate students from Novosibirsk State Technical University, guided by a professor of the University Airplane and Helicopter Construction Department, created the world's first fully aluminium engine. With a special technology called plasma electrolytic oxidization, they created aluminium crankshaft liners and flywheel. These parts are currently still only in any other engine. The engine weight is slightly over 200 kg, expected output is about 400 horsepower. A 2,000-hour cycle of ground tests is going on at Mochishi Airfield near Novosibirsk. In case the engine is up to service life expectations, flight tests will be performed using a Yakovlev Yak-52. The development stage took four years. According to calculations, if produced serially, this engine will cost about twice less than the equivalent Lycoming. The first ever monument on a Russian private airfield, as well as the first ever monument to ground technicians in Russia, was recently unveiled at Levtsova airfield near Yaroslavl. The statue depicts Makarich, the technician from Only Old Men Are Going to Battle, a cult 1973 Soviet motion picture drama about the World War II. The idea belongs to Andrei Serov, an aviation enthusiast who organizes events at Levtsova. Andrei shares the birthplace, a town named Danilov in Yaroslavl region, with Alexei Makarovich Smirnov, the actor who played the technician in that movie. It took about one year and a half to materialize the project. Since early May 2018, this proportionate bronze statue, radiating kindness and care, meets and greets all guests of the airfield, be them pilots or visitors. While the actor himself and the majority of wartime technicians are long gone, there still are veterans who witnessed those times and events. It is my youth. When I was young, I was a technician of Lavochkin La 5 airplane that was flown by the hero of the Soviet Union, Squadron Commander Guard Major Pyotr Bazanov. Yes, my youth. The motion picture perfectly reflects my service. Both I and Makarich were technicians of La 5 flown by heroes of the Soviet Union. It is a perfect match. So this statue, to a degree, is a monument to myself. There were several worldwide novelties that were publicly presented to global audience at Aero Friedrichshafen, the major European general aviation exhibition. One of such novelties was Borei, the new Russian amphibian airplane, of which our audience is already aware. It was exhibited at the booth of one of the first buyers, German WINX Aviation Air Club. In our report, we'll tell you why Russian airplane is so interesting to Germans. Two and a half years ago, I searched very intensively um, for a seaplane in the ultralight class uh, to buy for myself and uh, maybe later for distribution uh, purposes, but uh, it was really hard to find a plane uh, which uh, was uh, good enough and especially to match the weight limits for the actual um, regulations in Germany and Europe. Wings Aviation is a company that owns, operates and rents airplanes to private pilots. They plan to purchase amphibian planes and to develop seaplane stations in Germany and other European countries. Alexander and his colleagues scrutinized more than 10 different amphibian airplanes while investigating this market segment, but almost all of those planes had the same problem. They were too heavy for very strict European regulations. In Europe, Maximum takeoff weight of an LSA amphibian must be 650 kilograms. During my research, um, I made contact with nearly all um, ultralight or LSA amphibian aircraft companies. Uh, in fact, for Europe, only a few are offered in the market. And um, I flew one, I flew some of them. They were nice, but all had the same problem. The problem was they were too, um, they were too heavy for the rules, so 
from my point of view, it's not a good idea to sell planes, which you can only fly illegally. Alexander told the presentation audience that once he knew about the Beret project, he went to Samara to look at the prototype in person. After several days of demonstration flights, he was impressed with the plane's qualities and capabilities. Alexander then knew that it is the plane he wanted. Moreover, when the German shared his thoughts on what should be altered to make the Beret ideal for German and European markets, Aerovold management agreed and said that they would try to make the plane compliant. And they did it. First of all, they reduced the plane's empty weight to 380 kilograms. Now we have the new regulations and the Bore matches the weight limit perfectly. We made a first order of five planes um, just to test the market. Yes, the Russian planes are in production for me. Um, there are some changes needed for the new um, regulations of the German ultralight rules. And after that, we will have hopefully the certification within this year. Try to sell it. We have some queries in, for Germany and uh, other European countries for the Beret. So I am very optimistic that we can sell the Beret in uh, 2019. Because general aviation regulations are the most strict, the certificate issued by Luftfahrt Bundesamt, German Federal Aviation Authority, is recognized by almost all European countries. With it, you can sell planes in Greece, Italy, Poland, Finland, Sweden, Norway and other lucrative markets. You can use water surface as an airfield almost everywhere in Europe except Czech Republic and Switzerland. The next presenter was the CEO of ADSB, the Swiss company that distributes Air Volga planes outside Eurasian Economic Union. He told about sales conditions both for dealers and for private buyers. He noted that there are negotiations in progress as there is a huge interest in Bore and the manufacturer is full with orders until 2019. The third speaker was Loic Blaise, French private pilot who is already closely familiar with Bore. Aerovolga's seaplanes are famous. I mean, in the world of aviation, everybody knows about the LA-8. Uh, Second, I wanted to work with Russia, so I've been looking who, who was designing aircraft and then I had a lot of ideas, I was thinking about a lot of planes and uh, I saw that Aerovolga had a project that didn't, that was still to go on and to become something, so I made a call and uh, in Geneva actually and uh, we decided we would talk uh, together here in Friedrichshafen and that was uh, two years ago. That meeting concluded in Loic's participation in the 2017th expedition across northeast of European Russia to Pechora River. Loic said that he piloted the plane together with Russian cosmonaut Valery Tokarev and for the 4000 kilometers of flight he had no complaints about Borea whatsoever. So this year he decided to take part in circumpolar flight. Why? That's the way it goes for me, and for the Arctic it's exactly the same story. We are losing the Arctic right now, and it's the mother of all battles. And uh, we need to unite around that. That's uh, why I'm very happy to work with a Russian crew, because uh, the, if you wish to have an international impact on these questions and on the question of the Arctic, then you must talk with Russia first. There is no other way to do it, it's the biggest country in the Arctic. And plus, there is a strong knowledge about Arctic flights. And it comes back to Mikhail uh, Vodopianov, for example, uh, that pilot flew a Tupolev up to the North Pole and then has been on the ice for six months, uh, Chile. I mean, it's a wonderful story for kids. And uh, there is a strong knowledge in Russia about uh, how to technically handle uh, the Arctic. What I saw last winter when I was in Greenland was uh, very tough. There are villages that are just wiped away uh, from the face of the earth and uh, we need to do something about that. And if political people or it's the civil society is very slow to move, but we as pilot and aeronautical uh, people, we know how to handle emergencies. And it's our duty as pilots to handle that emergency because it's uh, well, it's worldwide and it's concerning everybody. 
This year, it's planned that Beret and two LA-8s will fly more than 18,000 kilometers in a month. About three quarters of the road are hard to reach and barely populated territories. During the venture, organizers plan to perfect techniques of flying beret in different and adverse conditions and, of course, to showcase Russian amphibians in the USA, Canada and Nordic countries. It helps that beret is quite powerful, has a good spare of thrust and excellent seaworthiness. Some of its characteristics are limited only by certification requirements. I know that the beret, for example, is uh, produced or it is set in the catalog only for a wave limit of uh, 0.5 meters. But in fact, we flew the Beret at much more wave heights, more than one meter, and we were, it was easy to handle. So it would be the same with the limit. Probably you can start with the Beret with 700 or 750 kilograms, would be no factor. But I uh, only want to be in the legal category. We'll keep track on the Air Volga Circumpolar flight and we'll tell about it in due course. As you could notice, the order roster for Beret is filled to the end of this year, but after August 15th you can come to Samara to take a closer look at the factory and the plane and take some demonstration flights. You can also see Flight TV issues 14th and 16th in English for more information. The year 2018 reminds of several major events in Russian aviation. One of them happened in 1988, when all Mil Mi-4 helicopters were completely decommissioned in the USSR. Yet, 30 years later, we have a chance to witness Mi-4 airborne again, thanks to enthusiasts from Moscow Dosov Aircraft Repair Factory. The project that aims to restore the machine to airworthiness is in its final stages there. Witness the second birth of a legend in our report. This Mi-4 at one of Mars' shops still doesn't look airworthy. Yet, a specialist will instantly see how this machine is different from monuments and museum exhibits. It is nearly assembled, almost all necessary parts are in place, and it will soon be ready for ground engine tests. This Mi-4 is one of the latest, and it is really lucky. It was transferred from Air Force to Dosaf Aviation and has little hours, as its overhaul date coincided with the commission. Since 1988, the helicopter was preserved at the factory in hope that sometime it will fly once again. The restoration works commenced three years ago. When I was appointed here in May 2015, the shops were empty. To create a workload and to bond workers to our aviation history, I decided to take an almost forgotten Mi-4 from an open-air storage. Actually, it was the first machine we rolled into facility when I came here in 2015. We're working on the project for almost three years and currently we're close to completion. The helicopter is remarkably well preserved. After disassembly, fault report and hull inspection, there were neither fatigue wear nor mechanical damages nor serious corrosion found. All records on this helicopter were lost, but expert assessment shows it has no more than 1500 hours on it. Such conclusion is also logical, because last Mi 4s were seldom used by Dosaf. On this helicopter, I can say that its hull and structural elements are compliant to all technical requirements and it is good for further use. I mean, there are no serious deficiencies here. The skinning was slightly damaged during disassembly, some other things were cut off, but that's nothing critical. It is repaired according to all procedures. One of difficult issues with historic aircraft is completion. As luck goes, Mi-4 helicopters were repaired at Mars and even after 1990s havoc, a lot of useful things left. Landing gear, main and anti-torque rotor hubs, swashplate, transmission and even the Asha 82V engine. All that was found in storage, overhauled and in pristine condition. Shafts and anti-torque rotor transmission were taken from early Mi-8 as they are fully compatible. All rubber parts were molded afresh, then everything was tested and installed. A number of compatible avionics were taken from AN-2 and Mi-2. The only thing that was not found were propeller blades. When rumored that we restore a Mi-4 spread, guys from Kirzhach Airfield brought us anti-torque propeller blades. Perfect new old stock from 1970, packaged with all papers in ideal condition, we are really grateful. As for the main rotor, it's another story. There are absolutely no blades in decent condition anywhere. Of course, we'll need help of some blade-making factory and probably in the end we'll find them. 
we have two options. People from Terjok Air Force Base are willing to help as well as helicopter operators from North. All of them have Mi-4 as monuments or museum exhibits, but set a condition that we have to provide them decently looking replacements. And that's where we hit the wall, because even on our monument, main rotor blades are from Mi-8. Hopefully though, we'll solve that problem. The restoration is conducted according to manufacturer's guidelines, but those guidelines were literally mined spec by spec, because even Moscow Mid Helicopter Factory Archive doesn't have complete set of documents. Yet, with joint effort and kind help of various people, full documentation was collected. Mail factory employees who often come here for business are really interested. They give us private consultations and try to help in search of spare parts and with other things. One more critical step is in order. Airworthiness confirmation and certification as a historical aircraft intended for demonstration flights. This helicopter is restored in strict accordance with repair guidelines developed by Mill Bureau in 1950s and 1960s. As for the helicopter's own paperwork, we'll do it together with Siberian Aviation Research Institute that certifies single aircraft. Mi-4 helicopter holds unique place in Russian and global aviation history. Created in 1952 in just one year, it was the biggest and the most heavy lifting helicopter of the era. The task to develop this helicopter was issued to Mikhail Mil by Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's right-hand man himself. That was influenced by success of American helicopters during Korean War. Also, Stalin wanted to help Mao Zedong in taking over Taiwan, and that required massive helicopter assault. Mi-4 was created in haste, and that led to numerous nasty surprises, including fatal ones. Yet, by 1960s there was no helicopter in the world that could compete with Mi-4 in versatility and durability. It was the core of Soviet military and civilian helicopter aviation, as well as the first Russian helicopter widely exported. It's safe to assume that only thanks to Mi-4, Russia enjoys Siberian oil, gas and metals. Because of excellent response of Pinston engine, this machine was indispensable in mountains. In 1980s, pilots and technicians bid farewell to Mi-4 like to dear friend. Restoration of this helicopter means reviving memories of thousands of people whose lives were bound to it. It's a pity that a machine like that is history and it's sheer luck that Moscow Aircraft Repair Factory decided to continue that story. Here we can witness its rebirth and all works are impeccable. The main thing is that the enterprise director sees it as something extremely important, and that is half of success. The restored Mi-4 will eventually take its place at the Factory Aviation History Museum. And here we ask all our viewers, if by any chance you can help in search of Mi-4 main rotor blades, the restoration team will be really grateful, and so will we. Thank you for watching Flight TV. Please subscribe and follow us on YouTube and social media. We also have a page on Patreon, and your donations will help us to make our production better. Stay tuned and fly safely.